recording. Richie Bartle, we are. You are. We well, we are in the HR studio. You are in the HR studio. I like these ones. It's hard and fast. Like we met what three weeks ago, I think. Three Maybe weeks three weeks ago. ago. Yeah. At the East Chase uh, just, uh, Gin East Distillery. Chase. Yep. And now you're in the studio mm -hmm. on a beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon. And this is about as light heart as the conversation you get. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, you were talking. You were talking on the icebreaker. Welcome, by the way. Thank you. Well, uh, we were talking on the icebreaker, and you were talking about mindset that gets you. Th that is. That is. Uh, that is the sort of the, the optimal mindset to have to get through combat situations. I'm going to say contact situations, but series combat situations. You're in the shit. You're getting shot at. You're shooting at people. The optimal mindset. Talk to me more about that. What do you think that is? That mindset that that creates a warrior mindset. It's a warrior mindset. Like mm. when you think about the, the 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 best fighters out there, the best soldiers, sailors, aviators out there, mm. who are in those situations and who you've worked with, there is a common mindset. I think that they have. I think it's a minimal amount of people have it. Um, what is that mindset? What do you think on that? So we're, when we're talking about mindset, are we talking about specifically in combat or just generally? Combat. Combat. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, for me, like you hear it spoken about a lot, you know, the mindset in combat. For me, it, it's, you know, so much to do with the environment. You know, when, you know, rounds are coming in, you know, people are literally dying. It's... It's the environment that kind of brings you into that super focused kind of, you know, mindset where, you know, because it is life and death, you can just solely focus on exactly what needs to be done at that exact moment in time, if that makes sense. Focus is one thing, so that's part yeah. of it, I think. And then, but what about knowing what to do correctly? What needs to be done? What shouldn't be done? I what is the mindset? What does it look like? Like, think about, describe, in fact, what is your mindset? In On the iceberg, you spoke about a, a, a real bad situation in the mountains. You know, someone uh, got really badly injured. Someone else got killed. Um, what was your mindset then? Describe it. Describe the focus. Yeah, so like... You were assaulted as a position. Result, yeah, so... I said, I guess, for the people that can't see the icebreaker um yeah it was the first sort of job i was on um after i joined special forces um and some a team was clearing a bunker position first job was it very first job was yeah, it yeah. first mission first oh, mission right. yeah, okay. yeah interesting right. um, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was um yeah and some a, a team had gone up to clear a bunker position up in the mountains and the rest of the the rest of us are sort of down below, sort of um, watching um, about 50, 75 meters up the mountain. Um, so air had gone in. So God, I keep keep remembering I need to make this, put this in civilian terms. Um, the gunship had fired in. Airstrike, um, helicopter. Airstrike, yeah, yeah. Airstrikes had gone into the position um, and, you know, a lot had gone in. So kind of you know sort of thinking yeah they're they're done no one could have survived that kind of sketch um and when they're about 50 75 meters up these two pkms so machine guns just opened up on the team um how big was the team so there was uh there was four of them four of them going to clear the position your team no 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 so i was still i was down at this time um oh there's four going up okay four so going right, up yeah. yeah and um so yeah they got opened up on and as always happens in situations like that, the radios go down, so no one has a clue what's going on up there. Like, there's no no communications whatsoever, and we're eventually just getting sort of, you know, broken messages back. Like, um, yeah, we're we're taking casualties. You How know. far away were they? So at that point, they're about two hundred meters away. What was the terrain? So it was like it was sort of fields, like found fields but i was so after it um after the radio transmission came across obviously there's a casualty it was like right it, like i got ordered just so you know with, with a medic just you know get there and you know get up and just see what's going on um so it was like this mad dash across this open ground and but the fields were like um yeah it was like boggy sort of you know and you're, you're carrying a lot of kit like um so it was, yeah mad sprint across um 
no idea what's going on. And um, at, at, at the base of the mountain, my friend was there. He'd been shot eight times, um, took mainly to the legs, and one to the arm, one had hit his helmet. Um, and he, he, he survived <laughs> somehow. Was he, was he conscious? He was conscious at this point, yeah. And he, um, he uh, the painkillers they use is uh, ketamine. He was in a great place, <laughs> Later on. bizarrely. Yeah, like he was. He thought he was somewhere else. You know, like he didn't. Had no idea where, where he was or anything. Yeah, talking like loudly, shouting, laughing. Um, but um, so left him, and because there was another bloke still up there. Um, but because we couldn't put any fire up the mountain, we had to wait for the gunship to come back in orbit to put fire in, so we could advance. So, you know, waiting for, you know, this gunship to come round and you, you, you know how it is, you know, every second feels like a, an eternity when you're, you know, the, the fire's still going um, and you know your, your your mates are up there. But, you know, eventually this the gunship just opened up and it was like, you know, the whole mountain, you know, just erupted. You know, the whole night just turned red with the, you know, the shells because I think the... Oh, is it nighttime as well? Nighttime, yeah. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, okay, yeah, okay, night, okay. yeah. So, yeah, and it like completely like whited out the you know on the NBG so I had to flip them up and just you know everything just you know lit up which was obviously our signal to you know advance up and sort of getting closer and closer thinking yeah you know some something's not right here because you know <laughs> we're already too close like just at the bottom of the mountain um and you know still getting closer we're about 10 15 meters away and obviously that's when I first saw the other guy who we're going up to get um yeah, I saw him straight away, and you could just see in his face that he was he was dead. Um, one of the rounds had, you know, gone through his femoral artery. So, unfortunately, he, you know, bled out and died before anyone could get to him. And then, the, well, that that job was pretty much just then, you know, dragging his his body back down down the mountain. There was um, three of us that did that. Um, and yeah, so obviously back to the point of the um, <laughs> the of you know the mindset and the. The focus, like I, I don't know, just when, when you're in those situations, it's in a bizarre sense very easy because it's just you just have total clarity on what needs to be done. You know, when when we're at the bottom of the mountain, it's just like okay, we're just waiting for the gunship to open up. As soon as that opens up, we're just advancing forward. You know, we'll whatever happens happens and we'll react to it. But you know, you know, our buddy's up there, so we've got to go and get him. There's you know, there's no two ways about that. And sort of when you get to him, obviously. It, wasn't a desirable situation, um, but then it's just like, well, we need to get him down. There's, you know, again, it's black and white. Um, so yeah, and it's just that, you know, that sole focus and yes, like you, like I was saying before, it's like you're you're existing on a, a higher level almost. Just that, you know, the the, the adrenaline, the the situation, the you know, the I think I don't know. I feel like a lot of it's like quite primal, you know, as humans when you're put in those situations. You have to, you know, it's not like, it's not me deciding, all right, I need to up my game here. It's natural. Like it, it you know, and it, that focus just, it just happens, you know. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of my take on it. Yeah, I think I agree. It's like, it is, I, I agree with you. It's primal. It's probably a, it's pro sorry, sorry, uh, some people might get offended, but I think it's a, a state of mind that only men are capable of doing. Because of, mm -hmm. because of the impact, the chemical impact, or, or the, the impact that hormones and testosterone and stuff has on on the brain and what it does, and that's why men, you know, that's why we have aggression and things. It's this is for like aggression is for a reason. We have that for mm -hmm. a reason. It's 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 a it's it's an evolutionary thing. Like we need it, as in the human race needs mm -hmm. men of or did need men to have aggression, be able to do these things and focus because of what testosterone does. Gives mm -hmm. you massive, well, you know this. Massive injections of energy, massive level of focus, like laser-like focus. Mm. So testosterone does. It's it's one of the main reasons why men are better at things like sports than than women, and like fighting than women, because the, the, our ability to generate testo that testosterone and mm. laser-like focus gives us that. But it's not entirely primal, I don't think, because if it was only primal, then we we we. <laughs> We wouldn't know. We wouldn't have. We we would forget about things like tactics, being taught tactics and strategy and weapons. So yeah. I think. So I've, I've thought about this as well, and my kind of take on that was just the training that you go through, the relentless training that it kind of rewires your. So that you know that primal instinct is rewired almost. 
that you know like when you do hear the you know the crack of a gunshot go over your head it's not normal to return fire it's normal to you know just just you know try and become part of the ground and just get away from it because you know you know in the powers of marines you know any infantry regiment you just drill you know you you know the reaction to contact is you return fire i wouldn't say that's a you know it's not a normal thing but because you drill it so when these situations do arise you know you fall back on the the training then almost so does that make sense yeah that makes sense yeah, it's like yeah. uh it's it, it's it, I, I i agree completely it's like it, the training conditions you to know what you can do right the options available to you and know what you fucking shouldn't do like mm. absolutely shouldn't oh, yeah, do yeah, should yeah. not do it like it it changes the parameters so when your primal instinct kinks in and your adrenaline is pumping because of a another not a another whatever situation then your parameters are that which allow you to survive that new mm. military situation i think that's the case oh definitely because as you know there's i've got memories or lack thereof of you know if you're coming under contact and the next thing you know you've put half a mag down you're in cover and or you put a whole mag down you're in cover and you're doing a mag change and you don't really remember what like sort of it was really just it. yeah like and luckily because you know where it was you see it on the, the feed afterwards when you go yeah. back because like you you'd be like fuck did i did i return fire yeah. quick enough there what was i doing but you see it and it was yeah, you yeah. know it's just and you, you watch like interviews and stuff with people or think of your own reactions or actions on stuff where you know you've been um commended or whatever for whatever happened or someone's been commended like a there's living VC winners, for example, MC winners, you know, just mm. people, and they talk about it, and you, and, and you, and they're asked about, oh, so why did you do that? And they, they, they struggle to explain why, because to them at the time when they did it, they're just doing what they were supposed to do. It's not like a, they weren't making conscious decisions to put their own life at risk. They, it's below consciousness. When, it, when, when, in all situations, in contact situations, as you know. <laughs> You haven't got time to think, mm. like not consciously think. No, oh, yeah. should I do this or should I do that? You know, yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's like yeah, yeah. Between commanders, job at the back with you know who, who's who's making yeah, a yeah. combat estimate or whatever. But as a as a as, as the teeth at the front of the unit engaging with the enemy, you don't have time. You're just mm. making decisions on the fly, yeah, on the yeah. fly, which is you know, military training is it, it is a uh, it's a brainwash, right? It's a, it's a brainwash, but yeah. rightly so. <laughs> when you, it, when... but, but it's, I don't know, I feel like when you say brainwash, you're talking about beliefs. I wouldn't say it's a belief system. That, that oh, I, no, I would no, say I it's know. more of a rewiring yeah, of, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Than, than, than a brainwash. Um, so yeah, I think a, a lot of people are like, oh, you joined the military and you're just brainwashed and he's just like well i don't know they were never telling me any yeah, ideologies they don't or know what beliefs talking it's about. just like yeah it's you know they don't know what they're talking about i got a i got a a uh uh a person who well a family member and they said uh they said on twitter maybe and it's like something like uh British soldiers are just brainwashed to uh, just just they get told to kill and they'll just kill. <laughs> it's like you know, <laughs> and you know, and 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 and, yeah. uh, and, and I've got a, I've got yeah. another cousin. I've got two, in fact, I need to I need to try it because one of them listens to the podcast and it's and it's not her. Yeah, oh, right, okay. her right, and we had this. I had the conversation with her, and uh, and it's like no, it's not. It's not the way it is. It's not the way it is. It's like. We're, we're conditioned to follow orders when we're told to follow orders, but we're also given the leeway to say fuck off to yeah, the orders yeah. if well, we don't I mean, think it's, it's lawful. Uh, obey, like, all, obey all lawful orders is oh, the... Oh, good point, yeah, obey yeah, all lawful yeah, orders. So. It's like, uh, you know, it's like... Um, uh, uh, the, like the, the, the best example of that is... Uh, there's a saying, Who's, who said this? Um, um, men who, oh, what's the saying? Men who fire, uh, a man who fires in anger is a man of straw, or something. Oh, no, a man who fires it. In essence, it's a man who fires at an unidentified target is a man of straw. So if you're pulling the trigger and just firing towards something that you think is the enemy without actually seeing the enemy or identifying them, you're a man of straw. It's like you're just pulling the trigger to make yourself feel better. Your bullets aren't doing 
what you think they need to do, and they could be hitting anyone, basically. Mm. Have you heard that before? What is the saying? Anyway, so it's like, uh, you know, you as I was always taught, even before I became a sniper, it's like, you don't, you pull the, you only pull the trigger when you've got a clearly identified target. A clear, there are exceptions mm. to this rule. I know there are. I know there are, right? Yeah. In certain circumstance. But generally, you only pull the trigger when you've got a clearly identified target, right? That's yeah. predominantly what it is. What? Oh, God, here we go. So, don't, first, don't incriminate yourself. I'm not going to incriminate myself. <laughs> Joke, Herrick. <laughs> Joke. Oh, maybe I am. <laughs> Herrick 12 was, um, you know, that whole tour was. Like, I didn't see. Were there as a boot neck or as a. Boot neck, as a yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you'd, you'd, you didn't see the enemy. Where once. were you? Uh, Kajaki and Sangin. Okay. Where in Sangin? Oh, in Sangin, so, D.C.? Sangin, D.C., okay, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Um, and it's like that whole tour was pretty much, you know, the everywhere was just saturated with IEDs. So, like, the, the tactics became, or, well, like, basically went down to basically the front two men with essentially a metal detector, you know, in front of the rest of the multiple. And so you're just patrolling Fucking at a snail's horrendous. pace. Um, yeah. You know, I, went out thir- I was out on 13. My last, uh, so, yeah, my last Afghan tour yeah. was 13. So it must have been like that then. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just patrolling at a snail's pace. You can never move outside, the, you know, the barmer lanes that we called them. And, you know, that whole six months, I never saw the enemy. Not once. You're lucky if you saw a muzzle flash or dust getting kicked up. Most of the time it was just, you know, the rounds going over your head. And a lot of the time you had no idea where it was coming from. Like in Sangin, I think from our patrol base, like foot patrols, we never patrolled more than a couple hundred meters, three, four hundred meters away from the patrol base just because we couldn't. You know, because you're patrolling at this snail's pace. Um, and then, you know, they're quiet. just, uh, you know, the fire would come, like, there was sometimes we, we got contacted that. from what felt like back from our patrol base, yeah. you know, just because of all, you know, the compounds that have been destroyed and, you know, the snipers, you know, snipers and IEDs was was the threat. It wasn't like, you know, but by that point, you know, the early Herricks where, you know, it, it did sound more like kinetic sort of warfare. By this point, it was just IEDs, snipers, sharpshooters. You'd be lucky if you ever saw like mm. like I said, like a, a muzzle flash. So it's then like, what can you do? Like, you know, you, oh, no, you no, have to I, put I, fire, I know, you know, you're getting fired no, at, that, you can I'm, see kind I, of yeah, like... That, that's uh, the point, know. that's why That's why I said, you know, except in circumstance where yeah. you can't identify the target, you know, and, and the, you can legitimately fire pl- things that aren't, you can't identify the target to the, to the point you're making, right? But it, within mm. a circumstance, like you wouldn't do it with a fucking civvies event. Oh, no, no, but, no. no that course, was the case, yeah. mate. That was the case. I, I I, feel lucky in a way that I, I did I did, I did, I did three, tour, three Afghan tours over the... Do you want some water? Um, There's yeah. water in the fridge there. Go in the, go the, go in the, in the, bo- in the bottom and want to grab one of these cups. Uh, there's a big bottle of water in there. Uh, so I did, a, I did the first one. So... Uh, yeah, got it. I did the first one, I did one in the middle, so I did 06, 08, and then 2010 to 11. So I saw that change in oh, okay, the way right. they were engaging us, and it was, it was the first one was fucking, like, small arms, it was, you know, and then they quickly realised that they weren't very good at, it's like, we, British forces, are really good. <laughs> we are really good. <laughs> if you're trying to attack us with rifles and normal things like normal warfare, we're actually really good at fucking yeah. you up. <laughs> you will not win. You will not win. And that's when they switched to IEDs. And interestingly, to your point, they switched to using snipers. Mm. Interesting, because that didn't happen in Iraq. Iraq switched to IEDs, right? But it didn't incorporate snipers, not... Not against the Brits anyway. I'm not sure. I can't speak to the Americans, but it didn't really do it against the Brits. It was only IEDs. But in Afghan, it did. They incorporated snipers. In. Really interesting. Interesting nightmare. Right. Come back to your career, <coughs> if we can. <coughs> if we can. You you went. You got into SF very young in your career. Is that fair to say? Three years bootneck. So three, you're only in three years, and then you went. Yeah, so it's about yeah, about really. That, yeah. So yeah, I joined. I went to Limson in 2008, obviously, and 
past marine training and joined 40 commando in 09 um, and then went on herrick 12 in 2010 and so whilst i was on herrick 12 on that afghan tour so yeah we're, we're up in the mountains i'm in kajaki so on sail one night it was like you know, two in the morning and you know the shifts were <laughs> they were at the time you think yeah this is this is easy because you've just been through like you know recruit training and you know it's freaking awful so you know you're doing like four hours on six hours off um you know four hours on sort of sentry duty six hours off but in that six hours obviously you've got to go across the other mountains to get water and food you've got to sleep you've got to you know still exist and stuff so you don't really get any time off you you know you're exhausted the whole time so wait, wait, wait. so on the kajaki hill in the, in which the, one were you at in the peak oh, because you have sparrowhawk normandy and athens athens and Sparrowhawk yeah. we were on. There wasn't, um, I don't think, not, I think they'd shut down Normandy. Because it was, so which was the one furthest away? Again? Sparrowhawk. Sparrowhawk, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was that one. And then Athens was the first one that you come up to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, uh, pretty sure. This particular, yeah. Athens, yeah. Um, just looking out into the. I think that was the case, no. But looking, um, I think north. Which way was the green zone? <laughs> Because it was the other way to the it was the other way to the green zone. Okay. Hang on. A bootneck has asked me. A bootneck has asked the power guy which way the enemy are. Yeah, you know, yeah. Which way the green? Well, they're, they're everywhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you had the green zone, and then you had the which way was that? I'm going to sound like that. Let's just say it's north. north. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but um, anyway, yeah. So they're yeah, just exhausted, like two in the morning, trying to stay awake, and and you hear these like helicopters coming in. And you just oh, you know, wake up. You're like, oh, what's that? They go straight into there because. You know, north into the desert, we never patrolled into because the rifles on the previous tour had like a god awful experience of trying to sort of push that way. They just hit a belt of IEDs, they got ambushed and opened up on, and it was an absolute nightmare for them. So, pretty much off the back of that, our yeah, seat was just. East was the town. If I remember off of my head now, right? East was the town. Normandy, Athens, and Sparrowhawk ran from generally south southwest to north northeast that way so it was like if you're gonna if it was if you're gonna yeah. choose northwest east or south they ran sort yeah. of south north i think that way well, a bit of an angle if in fact on the only ways you could look from athens was back onto the dam or out towards the enemy the other way yeah so across the river yeah, was, yeah so yeah. northeast you were looking across all the dashed few little there was the garage people who going up People haven't been there. I fucking clue what on about. Anyway. So go on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, these helicopters come in. They go to this like you hear them like flying into this area that you know we can't go because it's too too dangerous. Was Kajaki John there then? Kajaki. Kajaki John. Was <laughs> Kajaki? No, it's a real Kajaki. person. He's dead now. He's Kajaki guy, John yeah. and Kajaki Mike, and they were occupied. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's just a fun. It's just a fun Jackie thing. John and Jackie Mike, they were CIA guys. Okay. They occupied the compound at the bottom. You know, next to the. I, uh, I don't recall a Kajaki. Yeah, John got so killed. Oh, Mike's oh really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I feel bad for. Laughing yeah, we well, feel bad for laughing now. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, but no, no. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a. Uh, I came out of the blue. I didn't. <laughs> anyway, go on. But um. Yeah, helicopters. Yeah, they come in and you know they they land and you know. Pretty much as soon as they land, there's a big firefight and they're scrapping for about an hour, and then the helicopters come back in and pick them up, and they, you know, you know, fuck off. Um, next morning, I was like, oh, you know, what happened? Who was that? Like, was it, you know, Delta? Was it SAS? And but one of the lads' brothers was in the SBS, and turns out he was on that raid, and oh. you know, so that was them. And so for me, it was kind of just like. Well, it's quite simple. I just need to join the SBS now because you know that's They're cool like, as fuck. yeah, and you know here's me, you know Tip like of the spear. Yeah, yeah, doing like four, you know these, you know fourteen hour patrols, just waiting to get ambushed most of the time, and you know that's the only excitement you're getting if you know, so you know otherwise it's just a fourteen hour back breaking patrol with you know your full day sack of GPMG link, um, these guys just flying back and yeah, to wherever they're at. Um, so yeah, pretty much off the, well, during that tour, I decided that, you know, I was going to go for selection. Um, and me and a friend who I was in the troop with, we, on that tour, put in for a briefing course, um, whilst we're on tour and yeah. So. What's it like within the unit? So I know from a power edge perspective, what it's like to, for someone to go and, uh, want to say, Hey, I want to join the SAS and, uh, and they get told, you can't fucking do that. Go for selection though. What's it like within 
the boot necks. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I think it's very character dependent. Like it, it depends a lot on. I think generally it's it's pretty good. Um, at, at like the troop level. Um, troop being how big? Um, Thirty, 30 blokes. So like a platoon. Like platoon yeah. Generally, like the lads and are pretty supportive. But I had um I was fortunate. I had a troop sergeant who because I was sort of talking to him on that tour. Because it's like, you know, so what you want to do, you know, you need to put in for a specialization. Um, what do you mean? Oh, so yeah, I forget that you, you, not every... I'm from the real army, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The real fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you got to put in for a So, yeah, the, the thing with the Marines is you've got all these different specializations. Yeah. Um, so, you know, mortars, anti-tanks. We have that. Chef, clerk. We don't have that. Um, yeah. We have the army, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got all those, and if you don't sort of put in for something, you can just get pinged for something. Like, I'd be, 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 you know, voluntold that, you know, that's what you're doing. And you so never... let me just understand this, right? Genuinely, gen so yeah. not taking the piss. So, I joined the army. Mm -hmm. I joined, and I said, oh, I want to join the pirates, please. Mm -hmm. Right? And I joined the pirates. Well, you say no, like, no, no. Did you say it like that? Probably, <laughs> yeah, probably back then, yeah. And uh, and I went and I passed the selection and all that, the, yeah. uh, the P company selection, and got in and joined the Paris, right? Mm -hmm. And so I joined as an infantryman, mm -hmm. uh, a base level, or a paratrooper, right? Other people joined and went, oh, I want to be an engineer, or oh, I want to be a driver, and they joined the logistics regiment, mm -hmm. or logistics corps, or engineer corps, or World mm -hmm. Corps engineer, oh, yeah, engineer corps. Right, so you join up and you select at the start what you want to do, and then you hopefully you're su successful in getting into that vocation you want to do. That is not the way Marines works, is it? No, it's slightly, Tell me them. slightly different. So you join the Marines, and then, uh, yeah, you, you spend... Uh, so it's changed a lot now, I hear, so I can only speak about how it was when I was in, and basically you, you sort of join and you'll... Go in as what they call general duties. So essentially, you, a marine doing, you know, infantry work. So everyone um, joins. So everyone joins, and when you pass training, yeah, you're going as GD, you, you, general you, duties. Everyone yeah. is always straight away a marine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In a infantry unit. Yes. Uh, so obviously the fine years are again. These are changed now. But when I was at forty, four two, and four five. So generally speaking, you, you'd go there. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then so normally after about three years, you kind of have to specialize. Years? Three, oh, yeah, right. three years. Okay. So I thought it was a good Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah, so about three years. So everyone basically, specialize. most people soldier for three years then? Yes. So you were telling me that a chef in the Marines has probably soldiered for three years, probably? Yes. They could have done tours as yes. a soldier? Yes. A as a, so holy just, shit. So, I like that. Well, the chef probably didn't. No, but, uh, but like it. <laughs> so, in gym. Oh, go on. so yeah. So back, back for me. I, I was <coughs> at the back of this tour, I decided to um, yeah, put in for the briefing course. Luckily, I passed it because that ring fenced me from my specialization drafts that I've been told, and they gave me a choice. Actually, I had the choice between a chef or a clerk. So what, how, why were you? Why did they select you for those? Oh, because of my bacon frying advanced. skills. Yeah, I was all over cooking that. No, it's, well, it's, like I said, is you know, there's the good drafts. So, you know, <laughs> heavy tanks, anti weapon like anti weapons, anti tanks, um, heavy weapons. Those kind of specialisations, which generally everyone goes for. So you never really get pinged for those ones. Obviously, no one wants chef or clerk. So they're the ones you get like voluntold that yeah, that's what you're doing which I think is a tragic waste of putting someone through 32 weeks of Royal Marine Commando training to then three years in, put them as a chef or a clerk. It's, uh, I don't know, mate. It's value in having chefs and clerks who have done three years of soldiering. Why? Because they know what the people they are serving or providing the service to mm. have done. But do, do, is that, do, and, they, do they need to know? Is that no? They don't need. For example, to, like I, don't, a, no, I don't think they need to know, but it mm. makes them. It makes them more relatable. Well, one thing I would say is that what we always saw is the like army clerks were generally a lot better because they were people that 
joined wanting to do that specialization so they're actually good at it rather than someone that wanted to soldier who wanted to fight <laughs> who hasn't been told he needs to be a clerk that's who a great doesn't point. give a shit that's a great about point. <laughs> that is a great point and is yeah. probably not made that for is a great point yeah. administerial that duties great like point. that um, that is a great point yeah 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 okay yeah I get it yeah yeah and certainly it didn't feel <laughs> too great like when I, all you want to do is soldier to be told yes sorry buddy for the next three years but you know for it kind of worked well for me because it was like <laughs> dear god i need to pass the election now because <laughs> i did not come here to uh yeah to sort people's paychecks out or cook bacon does did, did, did most people want to go for selection in boot next sp like um no no i wouldn't say most um I think, oh well, Marines certainly provide a very dispro disproportionate um, sort of, you know, level of manpower for, you know, given their size of like 1.5% of the overall military. Um, I think obviously the it varies, but I think, uh, you know, it's anywhere between, they then provide to SF anywhere between like 40 to 50% of the manpower. Um, yeah, but hang on a minute. And I think. Hang on a minute. That's the way you're presenting those stats. Mm -hmm. I'm just sitting here with my mm -hmm. pirate red shoes on, mm -hmm. boots on, and my. Oh, I've come to the wrong place to come out with that stat, don't I? Yeah, well, it's <laughs> misrepresentative. Why? Because SBS makes up 50% of. No, 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 wrong. 33.3% maybe if, of, the, of the special forces units we know. Mm. They make up a third of them, right? SB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And SB is overwhelmingly populated by bootnecks. Mm -hmm. well, I could say the same stat about Power Reg and say Power Reg provides, I don't know, I'm going to pull this figure out of my ass, 30%, I'm going to say 30% because less, 30% of overall UK special forces and make out like that's because Power Reg is amazing. We are amazing, but that's not the overriding reason why it's 30% of. No, I think half the reason why the Marines provides uh, I, more I wish it doesn't research. It's because a lot of the uh, they get told they need to be chefs for years in their careers. Fuck this! Am I either leaving the military or going yeah, yeah, yeah. selection stuff? Chef or special yeah, forces? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what's, what's it going to be? <laughs> No, but that's I've generally thought that because you know you join and because this was something that was alien to me. Like you're like what specialisations? When I was like meeting paras and stuff properly and talking to them for the first time, I was like, what? You join the paras and then you just soldier for your whole career. Yeah. So well, that sounds it good. It used to be like it used to be like that. Power Reg used to be like what Marines was like. Oh, okay then. It used to be provider. Well, they realised lads were absolutely fredders. And yeah, we <laughs> we move with the times, mate. Oh, uh, okay then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not like you lot. When was the Navy formed? Um. Fucking sixteen sixty six or something like that. Oh, Ancient, yeah. wasn't it? In fact, you're drinking from a Sailor Jerry's uh, cup. Nineteen forty nine. This says. That's oh, Sailor Jerry's, not <laughs> Navy. <laughs> Provided by a Navy person. Yeah. You're gonna pour some gin. Yes. Would you like some? Would like some. Yeah. Would like some. Um. What was your experience starting a business outside of the military compared to starting it inside? How much are you pouring there then? Jesus Christ. Compared to starting it inside the military. Um, so I mean, you started I was, HMG yeah, when you were serving. I started you started HMG. Hershey Gin when you left. So actually, the you know East Chase Distillers has you know it's been about six years in the making. So very much the... Oh, you mentioned the, this when I met you yeah, distiller actually. That surprised so, me, yeah. A lot to do with, you know, setting, like, a, a lot of the initial setup was, um, you know, with my business partner, Luke, was, um, you know, that was done whilst I was still, still serving. Um, I, I, like, it was, like, setting up HMG while I was serving, it was, it was kind of good, because it wasn't like when a lot of people set up a business, and it's kind of like, dear God, I need to make this work, because I need to pay the bills. Like, obviously, you could kind of do it at your own time, your own pace, like, you know, there wasn't that pressure on you could, you know, you could make mistakes because, you know, ultimately you weren't reliant on the revenue from the, um, you know, from the company. So in that sense, you know, it was, 
I think it was you know good. I think that's a good way to set up a company when you have already got a, you know, a a stable source of income. Um, so you can kind of find your feet, if that makes sense. I agree with you. I agree. No, one hundred percent. But but just thinking about that there, that there. Maybe, I mean, but bear maybe. in mind, so HMG is like an online clothing company. So you know, I'm not talking about like you know, like a huge multi-million pound sort of venture in setting up a new company, um, no, you know, for like a small venture. No, but it's yeah. popular and it, it makes you enough money to be significant. So that if you, if it stopped mm. today, you'd be like, oh. Oh no, of course, yeah, now. Ooh, sort of five years, you feel five years. Thing, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but certainly like, you know, the first year or so is, you know, real difficult sort of getting, getting it out there, but... <laughs> not having that stress of like, God, you have sales targets, I need to meet, you know, this amount of sales each each month. You can just do it at a sort of, you know, a pace that, you know, isn't reliant on, or, you know, it's not going to stop you putting a roof over your head, basically. I think that's it, valuable, right, if it's the first vis business venture. Yes. I think that's yeah, yeah, definitely. But if it's, yeah. uh, if it's something down the line where, there's something down the line where you, you, you've been serious with it and you think, oh, man, not, even, not being serious, wrong wording, but if it's something down the line, it, 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 mean, it there is a risk of you not paying it enough due diligence and attention and focus mm. so that you allow imperfections because mm. you can afford to, yeah. as opposed to focusing on not having the imperfection, having perfection and making it as, as profitable as possible. Mm. Uh, and as resilient as possible, and you know, long term, uh, yeah. and and as yeah, as, as long term, what's the word? Likely to last and long term as possible, uh, because you're reliant. Like there's, there's a thing that you said about being reliant on something for mm. your revenue, or for you. Yeah. No, never mind revenue. The revenue, but reliant on it to provide you what you need to survive: yeah. live, house, money, <laughs> car, mm. food. Water, yeah, school, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So, but, so, and you, you, so, yeah. you, you learnt your business acumen with HMG then. Oh yeah, and now you're applying those lessons with Heritage Gin. Yes, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, definitely. So you know, a lot of it was you know the, the marketing of it all. That's um, you know, and you know, using utilizing social media, um, you know, to to market the product, um, and you know, done a few sort of like courses as well, um, sort of in, you know, during that time. Um, but you know, when I started HMG, I didn't, you know, didn't even have my own social media account, knew nothing about business, knew nothing about marketing. It, they weren't even areas that I've ever been interested in, but, you know, had the idea for HMG. And because of that, it's like, well, how can I, how can I get this out there? And that is, well, essentially learning business and learning how to market your sort of ideas. Um, so yeah, definitely learned a lot by simply just doing it, you know, messing up and sort of learning from your mistakes and just, yeah, carrying on. I said, I'm talking from the perspective of someone that's, you know, com like was completely ignorant to everything about sort of starting and running a business. So for someone like me doing it in that kind of um, environment where you're not reliant on the sort of the, the income from it was a good way of doing it. Because it, you know, it wasn't just starting a business. It was like a learn. It was learning on the job kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it, it, yeah, to for someone like me to say leave the military and then start HMG would be a pretty stupid move because you know wouldn't have known anything like uh, about it. People do it. They don't know any better. People do it. Mm. Yeah. So why? Oh, you left because of your hearing, didn't you? Yeah. Medically discharged because of the uh, yeah the hearing. What was that like? I was in getting told you got to fuck. So, uh, it's an interesting one, actually. I need a piss. Oh. Second. It's still rolling. Okay. I'll cut this out. No. Right, we are back. We're rolling. And uh, I'm just going to make that this out uh, the gym, in all seriousness. I know I said it to you before. I'm going to say it on air now, though. I can't believe how smooth it is like i can drink the straight mm. and not even have a you know like you yeah you know like when you drink a, yeah, a, yeah. a whiskey and you, you go 
oh god, it makes you makes your face yeah. squeeze up. <laughs> this is like I don't understand. How do you get this? Uh, sorry, we'll come back to yeah. the leaving the bootnecks, oh, uh, yeah. leaving the leaving the military with you hearing. But how? Why is it so smooth? So how are you managing that? Because I've not tasted some of like this before. It was a long old process to get to the sort of flavour. So in the early days, so essentially the the whole recipe development was from about three years. So initially what we did was we just looked at the we, supermarket. We, so we, we, myself and my business partner Luke, we yep. just looked at the kind of the twenty sort of biggest gin brands that you see on all the supermarket shelves, on all the back shelves in bars and pubs, you know, the sort of ones that you all recognize and we bought them and what we started doing was just blind taste testing sessions. So we'd invite people around, we'd um, give them about, you know, five to 10 sort of small sips of these. Before you set the company up? Oh yeah, so this was about, th oh, so the, I mean, the company was set up, I guess, but you know, the money hadn't, um, I can't remember the exact timelines, but yeah, this was yep. you know, about three years ago. Yep. Um, so. Yeah, and basically with these 20 gins, just started doing these you know, blind taste testing sessions where you know people would just score them out of 10, um, having no idea what they were drinking. Um, and basically we just, yeah, collated, did that repeatedly and collated all the scores, you know, or done it enough to get to the point where you actually get some results of what, what we thought. What were you trying to do? Basically find out which gins actually tasted the best because what we you know what we found was that you know some of the biggest brands weren't the uh you know the best tasting gins of what and even interestingly because we used to ask people what their favorite gin is and the amount of times people say oh x is my favorite gin or that's my favorite gin and when it actually came to them scoring it they'd always score it super low so it's kind of like an interesting one on the, the power of marketing um do you know about that. the wine experiments i say that like that it's a conspiracy uh, uh, these are Becky's brownies, by the way, so I'm, I'm opening. Yeah. So if people can hear whistling, I'm opening Becky's brownies for pouring on number white, uh, 96, and now I've got number 197. Uh, look at that, look at that, look at that. You want to eat, if you need eight one of those now, you want to eat to eat for a week. You won't shit for a week either, I'll just clog you up. They look In naughty. a good way, mate. They look <laughs> um, so, oh, I say the wine experiments, I guess some X-Files thing. But they did, uh, they, I don't know who they were, but there was an experiment done years ago not experiment research done years ago and they got um it was basically to see what people's palate to, to test what people's palates are like were like and I, uh, and what they would pay for wine long story short they got in they got in um the organizers of the research experiment they got in like a bunch of different wines, 20 different wines, ranging from the cheapest wine you can pick up in Aldi, for example, up to the most expensive you can get in, you know, Marks and Sparks, or, but basically available to Joe Blocks. Mm -hmm. you know? And they had people do a, like you said, blind testing, taste the wine, give it a score, and, and yeah, basically give it a score on what they thought, how, how good quality they thought it was. Mm. And what they found across the board was that there was pe there was no difference in people's perception of quality or, of quality of the wine based on the price of the wine so so people thought people were, <coughs> there were cheap wines that were really good tasting basic yeah. is my point yeah cheap wines were really good tasting really good yeah and there were expensive wines that were really shit yeah no like it's like so the point being yeah. like the price of a brand or a brand or a mm. price is not an indication of quality. Mm. Yeah, but people don't realize that. So I think that's... Yeah. Well, it's 100% it's something we found doing this blind taste testing. Like, <coughs> it was interesting to see, oh, this is my favorite, never drink anything else. Then they've scored really low to, and then ironically to, to, to chins, they said they definitely didn't like. Um, oh, really? You know, so I guess, yeah. And again, it's just a, you know, it's just the power of marketing, I guess, um, you know, to, yeah, to do that. But so we got we got that, and eventually out of the twenty, we got sort of four flavors that were, you know, and luckily there were the flavors we liked as well. The ones that we scored at the top um, was generally sort of what came at the top. So then, with that, we had like a gin consultant that we'd sort of um, brought on board um, that helped us sort of, you know, build the, you know, he sourced the still from Germany, which is um, going to that because that is a big part of why it's so smooth as well. 
gave him the sort of gin. So from that, and his like 18 years of experience in the industry, he could sort of build flavor profiles of you know the the botanical mixes um because normally what you do like you just do a couple but sort of had this idea to, to follow on from this you know using lots of variations of it um got him to make about seven or eight variations of this you know flavor profile and from that we then blind taste tested those <coughs> um and found out you know which one people like the most one came out on top, so we took that and made variations of that and just refined it that way. Um, always getting sort of people in, and so it's not just us drinking it, you know, um, actually getting, you know, other people on board to sort of come up with it. Eventually came to a flavour we liked, and I said, so the, the still that we brought in um, from Germany is like an Arnold Holstein still, they're like a world leading still manufacturer, and that's a big part in the, you know, the smoothness and the quality of the product is the fact that it goes through that still. Um, so yeah, and then, and then, what's the, what's the process? What is the process? This well, it's, uh, it's actually pretty simple. So it's a three day process. It will produce about 850 bottles, 750 to 850 bottles. Um, essentially the first day is the actual mixing. So the, the, you know, the, well, it's not pure ethanol. It's, um, you know, neutral grain spirit is about 96% volume will go in, the botanicals will go in, the wall will go in, will bubble away, fuse through this copper column which draws out all the impurities which is what makes it so smooth. Can you boil it? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it boils. Can you boil that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and it evaporates through the copper column and that's what draws out all the, and mixes it all, it'll then come out and then into another sort of um, vat and then it'll just need to, it'll need to mix for a day. Um, and then after that, you'll bottle it for a day. So it's you say mix for a day, does it get rotated? Or something? Yeah. So when it's so when it's boiling through, um, sort of the different oils and stuff, it's all coming through at different times. So you couldn't just put a glass under while it's filtering through, because like to begin with, it's like a lot of the citrus flavors that come through. So when when you first like put your finger on the little you know, tap that's coming out and try a bit of it, about eighty six percent. And obviously, because it's eighty-six percent, you can only try like a tiny little bit because you don't want to go blind. Um, but it blind? tastes really blind. nice. Blind? Well, what if you drink, drink blind? Well, if you drink eighty-six percent volume alcohol, are you joking when you say go blind? I mean, it can. It well, can, turn you blind. It can do that stuff to you. Yeah. Really? It can. It can harm you. <laughs> well, eighty-six percent. Yeah, but only for a little, little bit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why you just dip your finger oh, right. in it. Oh, yeah, 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 you're not going to go blind. Just from, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You're, you're not putting a cup there and, like, downing it. <laughs> but the first bit's, uh, you know, like, super sitting in it. Like, you wouldn't think it's that. It tastes really nice, like, when it comes through. So it's all the citrusy flavors. Then you get some little earthy notes that come through. And but all different flavors are coming through at different points of the distillation process. Hence why you have to mix it for a day. So they all kind of, um, you know, get together. Which is a technical way of saying. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. it's interesting. It's my ass. I have no idea how it works. And then, yeah, just the, the next day is the, the bottling it up, um, and then you can stagger that process. So, you know, on the Monday you can start, and then on the Tuesday, whilst that run is mixing, then start another process. On the Wednesday, when you're bottling up that first run and the second run is mixing, you can start the process again. So, you, you can produce a fair amount with the still that we've got. What's the background between you and the business partner? How do you guys know each other? So we are school friends. We yeah, we went to Canada school together, and uh, yeah, remained friends, friends sort of um, throughout like a uh, time in the military. He became a he set up his own plumbing company um, after leaving school. Obviously, I joined the military, um, but we stayed sort of good friends, you know, throughout that time. And yeah, just you know, whilst I was still in, had this you know just idea for starting a gin company and completely separate. He had an idea for where did gin come from though? Why not? Hey, Where it did you was an, an episode of uh, Apprentice, and oh my God. one of the challenges was <laughs> people setting up a gin company, and I was like, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely nothing profound, <laughs> but you know, I really like gin, um, and yeah, it, it it seemed like a seemed like a good idea at the time, and here, here I am. So, <laughs> yeah, that oh, was so that was it. It's good fucking gin, mate. I like it. What, um, 
why heritage? So we wanted to sort of create a brand that, you know, we wanted to kind of like tie in sort of like, you know, kind of with a little bit, you know, keep that, you know, that for that local sort of market, but not anything like, we're never going to call it like Kenilworth Gin. Um, is that Kenilworth Castle on the It is Kenilworth I've Castle. I've just realised that. Yeah. Chip, throw the bottle Castle. over. Just realised that. Sorry, smash my myself. Just realised that, yeah, okay. Yeah, and because, you know, so much of, you know, it's, <coughs> you know, heritage is, you know, based around sort of tradition and stuff. And, you know, the way we sort of produce um, the gin, you know, everything, you know, the bottle is custom made by us. Our uh, custom designed by us, sorry. Um, you know, we do everything on site. You know, we produce gin in, you know, a very traditional way. Um, so we kind of wanted, you know, a brand that kind of reflected actually what we're doing. Um, so I guess, yeah, that is the... This bottle says London Dry on it, right? Mm -hmm. Which a lot of gins say on them. Mm -hmm. London, London, London Dry, explain yeah. that to me. What does that that's mean? The, that's the, the flavour. London Dry the is the flavour. The flavour is London Dry. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be like, yeah, your standard gin flavour, London Dry. This isn't standard. It's smooth. It's very smooth. Like yeah, like so smooth it's it's still technically a London Dry. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's, it's so it's quite floral, quite citrusy, which, yeah, a lot of the time it hasn't got that, you know, strong aftertaste that you get with a lot of gins, hence why you can, you know, drink it neat. Um, but yeah, this is absolutely easily drink it neat. It's yeah, not even yeah. a struggle. It's not even a struggle. No. Easily yeah, drink it's it dangerous. neat. It's dangerous. It's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's still, what is it, 36 oh, 40%, 40%, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it is dangerous. But yeah, we're it's about to bring out the next flavour, which is going to be a citrus orange flavour. So, definitely got a bottle across to you for that. <coughs> well, I think you buy a bottle off you for the giveaway for the patrons, but um, let's. Uh, Let's come back to where we were before I got distracted by your gin, mm. <laughs> which was um, oh leaving, yeah, oh medical discharge. Yeah, yeah, oh, mate. What's it like leaving when you don't want to leave? Well, so <laughs> all my hearing loss came from my time in the Marines. So that Herrick tour, where I was a GPMG gunner, a machine gunner. Um, so at, at this time during the tour, they started um, issuing sort of molded hearing protection. Um, so I did that all before the tour. Good stuff, that. Sorry? It's good stuff, that. <laughs> was it? Was yeah. it? Well, they gave me mine. If you wore it, it was good. They yeah. gave me mine at the end of the tour. So I went through the whole tour. There was, you about, are five, there was about five in the troop who like didn't get it. And, you know, as you know, you can't go out on patrol with them, like, green things on you or, like, yellow. Well, we never used thing. to wear them anyway. Well, yeah. We never used to wear them anyway. It's, no. But there's so like well, obviously just being a machine gunner on no quite kinetic toys, you know, with no hearing protection is not good for your hearing. But there was one time up in uh, up in Kajaki, and it was the Americans were coming in, uh, American Marines, and they're artillery guys. Um, so you know they don't man, you know, like heavy machine guns like that. They not their role. Anyway, the guys on the ground are in contact. So you know, just now fizz getting shorts. You know, we run to explain one explain the, the scenario. Yeah. Got this started like I don't I don't know right, okay, so the roll up in the up in the mountains there was um you know machine gun positions mounted to provide covering fire for guys patrolling out on the ground if they got into um, a firefight. So you know one day guys get into a firefight so run to man the gun positions um, and you know no time to grab any hearing protection or anything it's literally you know just in shorts you know just get there. Um, Another guy got on the gun, and I was number two on the gun, so it was my job to pretty much just get the box of, you know, 100 rounds, put them in the feed tray, load the gun up, and then because I had no hearing protection... Make sure he's got ammunition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, it was literally just stick my fingers in my ears because it was these old Russian bunkers from... <laughs> from back in the 80s, and, you know, the sound goes nowhere apart from back into your I ear holes. I think we were in the same, the same trenches really? at different times, yeah. I was in that same trench, those same trenches, six years before. God, five years before, yeah. We should hug. <laughs> <laughs> on. But um, but yeah. So anyway, it was literally a case of yeah, getting these boxes on and just sticking, and just the the sound from it, you feel it in your face. It like felt horrendous. But 
Anyway, this American comes in and he's like, oh man, what can I do to help? I was just like, prep those boxes for firing, meaning take the lid off. <laughs> just, anyway, this guy, he, he opened the boxes, he took all the ammunition out and just linged the boxes outside. Oh, no. So I turned back around and he's there. And they, it's like 16 kilograms, oh, 100 oh, rounds of 50 cal. A belt of 50 yeah. cal ammo, yeah. So I was like, oh, fuck. God, so I was having to hold. I was having to hold the movie. Yeah, like it's a movie. Yeah. yeah, and just having to like you know hand feed the rounds in oh, so no. they're not getting caught, and uh, you know, and put about two, three hundred rounds through, and just after that, like for a week, I was just in a daze because just yeah, and so that that was you know the the rest of the tour didn't help, um, but that was you know that certainly wasn't great either. Um, so anyway, came back off that tour pretty pretty deaf um and uh put for selection past selection um and then i couldn't clear my ears for no diving. fucking way you did selection after that yeah deaf well like, how did you pass the medical <laughs> well have you ever? I know you passed. The medical. <laughs> I just realised that you passed the medical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I passed multiple oh, medical. Yeah, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so okay, yeah. Cause, Holy um, shit! So, yeah, well, like coming back to that. So, for yeah, join, and then I couldn't clear my ears for diving, so I had to go um, to the Institute of Naval Medicine for them to look at my ears. And as as part of that, they do a no shit, you can't bend it hearing test, where the blokes literally they're like staring at you like that. Whilst you're sort of pressing the button to the beep, so it, well he decides when the beep goes, so you can't do it yeah. in the normal way that you would. So they quickly found out that I was like really deaf. So then because of that, they started looking at all my old um, hearing test scores. <laughs> like he said to me when he's looking at, he was like, "Yeah, so your hearing's not great." He's like, um, "Actually, you, you, you've got the hearing equivalent of the of an 86 year old man." <laughs> and I was there. I was there just like, you know, what? And he was like, you've got the hearing of an I don't know what you fucking said. Like. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, more to that. He's like, I noticed you come back from, uh, you know, Herrick 12 in, you know, 2010. And, um, yeah, your your hearing test scores were really very good. good. <laughs> in, in, yeah, fact, yeah. in fact, too good. Like only, only, right. only dogs can score this high. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I must have had a good day, you know. Oh, God. <laughs> but yeah, so they found out. Obviously, my hearing was, um, yeah, far below the standard. But and so I like I was. It was looking like I was going to get kicked out of the military altogether at that point. Um, but sort of, you know, obviously, fought tooth and nail to stay in. My biggest argument being like, look, I've just passed election. Nothing has come out. Like you look at all the reports, and, and like there's been no questions on you know my ability to soldier. Surely selection should be the test, not what it says on that piece of paper over there. That you know, um, you know, and more to the point, you know, the reactive hearing protection that you get. You know, it, you know, you, you turn them right up, and you know you can hear hear not too bad again. Um, thankfully, well, I had a good OC that came in and fought a lot for me to stay in as well so you know a lot of it was down to him but you know thankfully managed to stay in um so when it came to me being medically discharged you know part of that was my choice because when they when they allowed me to stay it was kind of like you know we're happy for you to stay on but if it sort of gets to the point where you know you believe it's you know you've had enough then basically you've got a medical discharge in your sort of back pocket that is um, fucking crazy by the way that situation, that is crazy. Yeah. For you to have that, I mean, that's a gift. But, uh, yeah, it was, um, but so, like, you I, know. The like shit I, is, it is that you're deaf. Like, Regular yeah, yeah, shit yeah. is that you're deaf. Like, you know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a couple of stages yeah. above you. I'm, 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 when we met at East Chase, when we met, I thought, immediately thought, oh, this is good. He's got the same kind of deafness as me, but worse. <laughs> this is, I could, you he's know, like, he's like, like me, but shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I bet you're really good at lip reading. I'm not even good at that. Yeah, I just I, mean, I need to get hearing. I reckon you are good at it. You just not, you're not, not don't realise yet. Oh, okay, I can then. try it, mate. Switch oh, okay. the TV off. I first realised it. Switch the the sound off on TV. Oh, has see, no I, subtitles. I have subtitles. I have to have subtitles. Yeah, but on, switch yeah. subtitles off. And but then you, I won't know what's going on. <laughs> you will because you can lip read. You just don't realise it. Okay. Do you have to be watching people's mouths when they talk? Okay. Do you, when people talk, do you have to be watching their mouths? Um. 
I don't know. I feel like it gets a bit weird if, if, it's, if it's someone's background lips no- too much. Yeah, yeah. I'm, if it's background noise, like in a yeah. like in the club, for example, in a pub, mm. I have to be watching someone's mouth move. Or I can't. I don't know what they're saying. Mm. That you lip reading. Switch the sound off on the TV. I'm telling you, you can lip okay. read. Okay, I can, I can lip that. read. I'll I'm try. Telling that. you, you can do it. I'll try. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Percent. I'll let you know how I got on. God's <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's a fucking nightmare. <clears throat> that's a nightmare. I can't really mm. go in. Can't even go to SF with it. Shit here, but it's a good point because that when that here that molded here impression that you're talking about came in, that was a fucking godsend. Yeah. That, that came in on my like, last tour. Yeah. Oh, like, I can oh only God, imagine because it, it blocked the here, it blocked yeah. the bad, it reactive. The, the bad yeah, noise yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Blocked, yeah, it was reactive. Yeah, blocked the bad noise out. But you know, what do people call it now? Because earbuds do it now. AirPods do it, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they've got a, a degree of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. They block the, the yeah. they block fucking loud noise out, and they they um, amplify yeah. Yeah, the stuff you want to yeah, hear. Yeah. That's what that did. Yeah, that yeah. I've still got it. That model of the events. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've still got it. You need to find a way to plug into my Samsung. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because yeah, they tried to get me to sign for it, saying I signed, like saying I got it at the start of the tour. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Crazy. But, um, but yeah, so yeah, that was good. Yeah. Crazy. What's it like? Um, how do you find it uh, existing where you're no longer a guaranteed salary and you are responsible for making your money along with your business partner? What's that like? Um, I think it's. It's good. I kind of like the uncertainty. I think it like you know pushes you and drives you that little bit further. You know, if you're comfortable, you know, you know, what have you really got sort of you know pushing you to sort of like you know try harder and you know really make things work. Um, so it's. I think it makes. I don't know. It's stressful at times, but you know, I wouldn't say stress is always necessarily unhealthy. Um, be more on how you manage it but you no know, I think it's uh it is very different because you know like in the military you just money's not something you ever think about because you know you're getting paid at the end of you know every month um and certainly when you're away a lot you know you're going to be saving a lot of money so it's mm. you know it's uh yeah it's a well it is nice in in, in that sense um that you you never really or well, I certainly never really had um those kind of stresses um but yeah I like it it's uh Nice to do something different, you know. Would you change anything you've done in the past? No. So then, oh, sorry, why ever? You said that with conviction. Um, no, yeah, I don't think... Um, I don't feel like um, thus far there's much more I could have really... I certainly don't... There's nothing I regret not doing at the moment in my life. So... Is that the question you're asking? Or we thought of. Yeah. Sort of. Nothing you regret not doing. What do you regret doing? Sorry, there's... I worded that wrong there. Like, I don't wish I had done something else. Okay. Um, like, I haven't got that, oh, God, I wish I'd done this, or I wish I'd done that instead kind of thing. If that makes sense. Are you going to keep HMG going? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's been... um. With the distillery setting up at the moment, in the process of changing suppliers, it's been a bit of a, you know, difficult to juggle everything at the moment. That with you know, family, um, home life, and then doing some work, um, CP work abroad as well. It's been a lot to sort of juggle, but yeah, no, definitely, um, HMG isn't going anywhere okay. anytime soon. It's Ali Kit, mate. It's Ali Kit. The gin's good. The HMG's good. It's cool. It's like uh, it's nice to um, it's nice to have. It's nice to know of a. It's good to know of a, and to have another a, a veteran brand in the space, which is I don't know. It just exists for like the, the roots of the business or businesses heritage and HMG. The roots of it are like authentic. You know, it's like. Uh, real stories behind it you know there are businesses i'm not just talking about veteran owned businesses but there are businesses just, they just exist because people want to fucking make money at the expense of others mm. and there's nothing really behind it. there's no substance it's just a it's mm. just a thing and, and there's a there's a, a gap to plug and they can do it but well, that's fine but when there's substance behind it and a story behind it it's, it's so much better like uh the heritage and when it's a fucking great product like you yeah. know yeah i keep buying out about heritage gym but since I went and met you at the distillery. 
been banging on about it ever since because I'm, I'm not a big, well, I wasn't a big gin person because I didn't like the taste. Mm. Genuinely. That's a fair reason it. not to be into it. I like gin and tonic. Mm. That's all I have. I, gin, I like the taste of gin and tonic. Mm. I'm not a big gin person. I don't like the taste of gin. Right, you know, right. I don't go out and have gin and tonic every night because I don't like, it, that. it's just like a once every so often thing. But this is so fucking smooth. Mm. Yeah, well, no, the, the feedback um, thus far has been you know, so real good. positive. It's, it's, been, so yeah, good. it's been good. And it's good as well because, you know, when we're, you know, you're, producing it yourself you design the bowls yourself it gets to that point before you actually go to market so like, where are you shipping them out from are you shipping them out from the yeah yeah so we're yeah um from the from distillery, the distillery yeah, there. yeah 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 when i said so for people listening when i said distillery there we put well, I'm, I'm i'm pointing on my head just because it's like 10 minutes away from the studio <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's good yeah that's good it's good have you um What's next on this? What's next on the radar for Heritage Gym? What's the next step? You got that so, for yeah. You got London Dry fla flavor profile. Yeah, flavor so you have the London Dry flavor. flavor. So yeah. in a couple of weeks, um, we'll have a citrus orange flavor coming out, and I'll be in an orange bottle. Um, following that, we've got a sort of red berry summer fruits flavor. Um, to follow that, there'll be a sort of apple and rhubarb flavor. We're thinking, and then for Christmas, um, will be a winter berries. Flavor. So by the end of the year, we are hoping to have five flavors out. Um, so it'll be a nice little, nice little range, and all the all the bottle coloring's been sampled. So they're, we're happy with where where that's at. So it's just um, yeah, getting the getting the recipes sorted now, basically. Excellent. Question I meant to ask you right at the start: Where is your accent? I cannot put my finger on your accent. Uh, I cannot do it. You so. Uh, I think a bit of it's sort of being in the military, you know, you're in a it's, constant You've got a weird accent. Have yeah. you told it before? But, so I was, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, have you told it before? You, so your accent's weird. I was yeah. actually born in Australia, so I don't know if that has something to do with it. Go on. Um, <laughs> I reckon so. <laughs> in Australia? <laughs> Go on. How are you born in Australia? Not how. Uh, well, I, I was going to say to you. I understand like, the mechanics. So my mum and my dad <laughs> <laughs> were in Australia, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is real weird for me. Do you want me to go further? Or? <laughs> so, uh, so you got Australian parents? Uh, no, so they're both British. They moved over there and um, yeah, met over there. Um, so I was born there, lived there for two years, moved back to England for you five speak years. Um, I did at a point, at a time. I would by speak Australian. Do you mean do I have an accent or <laughs> language? <laughs> <laughs> but, it was um, a bad joke. Is there an Australian? Oh, yeah, I should know that. Um, so I moved back to England for five years. On seven, moved back to Australia. And then when I was 12, we moved back to England. So at that age, for a couple of years, I definitely had an Australia strong, Australian twang. But I think it's, yeah, been diluted since. It has to be what it is. You say some things, and you, you, you whether it should be like hard Gs or hard Ds, and you're not doing it. You're doing soft Gs <laughs> or soft Ds. And I'm like, what the yeah. fuck is going on? What's this guy's problem? <laughs> yeah, but it sounds like almost like American sometimes. Oh, really? I, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, it, parts of it sound American, but oh, it's okay. not. It's not. It's just like a little, what you associate with American, but... An American accent, yeah, no. But it's been a pleasure. The uh, yeah. generally, well, you know, I like the gin. I'm sure fucking the gin is fucking great. Really good. Oh, thank you. HMG, love the clothing brand. Hope it keeps going. A lot of the people think hope hope is going. You know, it's uh, there's um, there's so many veteran-owned uh, companies out there doing or clothing companies, particularly out there that um. You're one of the originals, I think. In my mind, you know, you're one of the originals that is out there, like a staple, like a, a, a an aspiration. That new, I'm not knocking that there's loads out there, or any new ones going to start. But it's like a look to you. They look to you to go. Yeah, that's what I want to be. I want to be one of those kind of, you know, one of those kind of brands. Well, yeah, definitely be a definitely be a compliment if anyone did think that of uh, of of um, HMG. But yeah, because I remember when it started, like all all I was was aware of was was Contact Coffee and Sin Eaters, which um, started, a, a, I think, a little bit before, a similar time. Um, I think it was a year before. I think. Was it a year? Oh, I was a year before. I just remember it? where we met. It was a HR4K. HR4K business yes, event. Yes, yes, yes. That's why I just remember where we met. Yeah, First yeah. time, yeah, you were there, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, the Sin yeah. Sin Guild was there as well. Team yeah. Rubicon UK was there. Yeah, who um, else was there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Contact Coffee yeah. was there. You had a stand, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah, did, yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. We did meet there. Sold yeah. a few t-shirts, yeah, yeah I remember. What is it with pool and long hair? Um, that is a good question. Um, so I actually had long hair before I joined the military. 
like I it was like down to here then like uh, um so fringe no <laughs> no I look like properly look like a girl like uh, into all you know like 80s thrash metal and stuff and they all had long hair so I was just like yeah I'll just be like those guys and didn't look like it at all just looked like a girl um but obviously when I decided to join the Marines it's like right gonna need to get a haircut because you know those guys they don't get it but yeah Jump they don't get it. Yeah, like, it's yeah. <laughs> like it's their problem. Like it's their problem. They don't get yeah. it. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> their fault. <laughs> they are not cool. But yeah, join pool and you sort of look around. And you're like, okay, that's the that's the level that hair can sort of get to now. So <laughs> you can't get away with that in Hereford. No, they they. I think it's because so get away many people. Much in Hereford. I think it's because so many people in pool do it. So it's like seen, seen as a, uh, a pool thing. So oh, I don't want to look like them. <laughs> But I yeah, don't know. I, I reckon it's because it's more. It's smaller. Pool's smaller. It's, it's smaller. I think there's, so less, and... there's less. There's less headshed on camp. You can get away. We can get away with more. Maybe. You know? yeah, yeah, I reckon so. I think I don't know. Like what? Well, <laughs> yeah, one of um the RSM said to me once. Oh no, it was before he came RSM actually. But he was just like, when I'm RSM, I'm going to tell people like you, you're not allowed to get a haircut until I say, like uh, just. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's a way of like, you know, him inserting his dominance. Yeah. <laughs> it just completely flipped her. Ooh, yeah. scary. <laughs> you know, your hair's already down here. And like, uh, I mean, okay, I don't think it's going to grow much longer, but. <laughs> uh, been a fucking pleasure. Um, oh, Heritage Gin website. Yeah, uh, if you head over to eastchasedistillers.com, you'll be able to find it there. And obviously on Facebook and Instagram under East Chase Distillers too. Hey, Jim G. HMG, HMGclothing.com, yeah, and same again on Instagram, Facebook, HMG Clothing. it should come up. Yeah. Yeah. Good, man. I'll get a bottle off here, do a giveaway for the patrons, oh, and, awesome. yeah. um, and you are going to be at the Rugby for Heroes yes. Beer and Gin Festival in yes, June. Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Looking forward to it. Sounds Good. like a great event. Great event. And... Right, if you're down that way, well, no, if you were down that way, there's a H hour expedition in the inverted commas road trip. This year, we do it every year. This year, we're down southwest, the Cornwall Peninsula. Mm -hmm. We're going to finish up a pool. Mm -hmm. We're going to stop into S bomb. Oh, and okay. have a couple of beers and something like that. We start on Friday. So I'll, I'll send you the details for that if you're yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah. And then finally. That's it. Wait. No. Good. Well, we could. Glad we could do it, mate. Yeah, good luck no, with heritage. Yeah. And good luck to you and Luke. And um, let's do it again soon. Yeah. Yeah. It's been awesome. Thanks.